a tool designed to help protect people's privacy has been exploited to collect information that could be used to spread misinformation and malware, potentially targeting corporate headquarters and government offices. To use a privacy framework to disguise the collection of data is such a, it's, it's audacious, it is disrespectful, but it tells us um, that they are on the dark side. <laughs> of this technique. Um, it, you know, it, it tells us that they're doing a recon of some kind. They're gathering intelligence of some kind. What? Okay, a little backstory first. To help advertisers, publishers, and ad tech firms comply with Europe's privacy law, the General Data Protection Regulation, Ad Industry Organization, IEB Europe, created the Transparency and Consent Framework. For our purposes here, what's important to know is that the TCF provided a means for websites to tell advertisers and ad tech firms if someone visiting a site had provided their consent for their information to be collected and shared with other companies for purposes like targeting them with ads. Whether or not someone had given their consent is communicated by passing around what's called a consent string. This contains information about whether someone had given consent for their information to be collected or not, and who that information could be shared with. Think of this process as like when a restaurant server writes down someone's order and then passes on that order to the cooks in the kitchen. The restaurant is the website, the server is the consent management platform, this is an outside company responsible for creating the consent string, the order is the consent string, and the cooks in the kitchen are the ad tech firms looking to fire some code and send back an ad that can or cannot be targeted depending on whether someone gave their consent for their data to be shared. So that's how the transparency and consent framework is supposed to be used. Now, what is the dark side of this technique? Well, Kaylee's company Confiant found that a small Eastern European ad tech company was using the transparency and consent framework to collect information on millions of people in the US who are using Android devices. Kaylee said Confiant isn't publicly disclosing the name of the ad tech company behind the exploit, but she did give me the backstory on how Confiant came to dub this exploit Voldracus. We wanted to give it the most uh, Harry Potter villain energy we could. Kaylee also walked me through how this company that I will now be referring to as Voldracus used the TCF to covertly collect people's information that could be used to identify their homes and workplaces and transmit that information to its own servers to potentially sell to other companies or even governments. Step one, a person in the US using an Android device visits a website. Step two, an ad from Voldracus purchased using the open programmatic marketplace is served to that person and the data collection process begins. Step three, the Voldracus code runs and pulls data about the person's device. Step four, after the data is collected, Voldracus's code tucks it into a fake consent string that disguises the data, turning the consent string into basically a Trojan horse for the collected data. Step five, the code then creates a tracking pixel, which is just a one pixel by one pixel image, and adds the consent string to a URL attached to the pixel. Step six, the code adds the tracking pixel to the ad on the site. This triggers the site to make a call to the URL attached to the pixel because the site thinks it's supposed to load an image and that that URL is where that image is stored. Instead, at the other end of that URL call just so happens to be Voldracus' server. So calling that URL results in the consent string being sent to Voldracus. Step seven, Voldracus decodes the consent string to uncover the data collected from the person's device. There are a few things that are pretty weird about what Voldracus was doing here. High on the list is the fact that it didn't even need to use the transparency and consent framework. The transparency and consent framework was designed to manage consent for people in Europe to comply with the GDPR, but Voldracus was targeting people in the US. That to me is the first interesting thing is that there's even US data involved here with the GDPR centric framework. I don't know why that was being deployed. So the whole thing is a little bit fishy, to be honest. What makes this case especially odd is that it was taking place in the United States, um, which is not a GDPR jurisdiction and TCF is a framework for GDPR compliance. So the um, data protection regulation in the EU and so that should have been a red flag to begin with, but overlapping jurisdictions are not unheard of, so it might not necessarily have set off um, any red flags. But here's the thing. Voldracus shouldn't have been creating consent strings of any kind. Voldracus was not a registered consent management platform, so any consent string created by Voldracus was automatically invalid. A valid consent string would have to be created by a registered consent management platform that provided notice to the user and had the means to collect um, the user's privacy preferences. So those cookie banners that you see in California and Europe 
Those are created by consent management platforms. And when you interact with them, they encode your privacy preferences in a consent string data structure. Um, and they are not a registered consent management platform. There was nothing in this code that could possibly have collected consent from a user or provided notice. Um, so this was never, it never originated as a valid consent string. This was purely um, uh, a means of encoding and disguising the data. So what was the data being collected by Voldrakis? Well, it included information about a person's device, like the browser being used and the device's operating system. This information may seem kind of like, so what? But it can be used to do what's called device fingerprinting. This is a process of puzzling together a bunch of different, seemingly harmless pieces of information in order to establish a way to identify a device and track it online. User agent string, which gets sent every time your browser makes a request to the server, um, you know, that's just revealed in every little handshake. So that would show um, what browsers and what browser versions you have installed and operating system and things like that. And that itself is pretty unique and that itself can sometimes be enough to identify you across um, apps and devices. Voldrak has also collected other information though, weirder information. Information that raised even more red flags. A device's precise geolocation, its battery level, whether it was in motion. Device motion is a pretty big red flag. It's not commonly used at all. Battery is pretty commonly used. Device motion is not. Um, geolocation is used not usually to this degree of precision. So what battery level can do, especially when combined with something like device motion and geolocation, um, that can tell you a lot about where someone is at any given time, where they're going, where they've been. The thing about um, get battery, it it returns a promise that can show you charging, charging time, discharging time, the current level. Um, so it can tell you like, hey, this person is currently attached to a charger. So they're probably either, maybe they're in a coffee shop, but in all likelihood, they're probably at work or they're probably at home. So if it's currently charging, that right there tells you plenty. It's sort of an implied um, combination of factors that can kind of tell you where they are in relation to places where a person would typically charge their phone. Right. And I imagine you could also then, if you have the geolocation information, which I imagine would be latitude and longitude, you can also then be cross-referencing that with, okay, if this is charging and we know this is a residential area, this is probably the person's home then. That, that doesn't seem like too far of a leap. No, it can definitely get you the person's address, but it's also very likely if you are looking um if you are doing recon, for example, and you're trying to target someone who works for a certain agency, it can help you detect whether you found someone who probably works there versus maybe someone who's uh, just browsing on by and has never been there before to help you target either a person's address or um, a person's place of work, which the latter is very likely to be a, a, an, an item for targeting for future malware, spamming, phishing, you name it, um, which can then lead to an entry point um, to deliver all manner of bad news. As if this story isn't already weird enough, what's also weird is that Voldrakis actually didn't need to jump through all these hoops to collect this information. So there's really no need to hide browser fingerprinting. So what drew our attention, the self-defeating thing about this obfuscation technique, <laughs> you know, was the fact that they were abusing a privacy framework and going to these lengths to encode and disguise this data. Had they not done that, um, we might have seen it, we might have frowned at it, but there wouldn't be a story here. So why would this small Eastern European ad tech company go to such lengths to go undetected while collecting this information? Well, there are a few potential reasons, none of which are all that comforting. This is ad tech, so it's probably going to be used for some kind of retargeting, for delivery of scams, for delivery of disinformation, for delivery of malware, um, or perhaps the data collection itself is the end goal. And they could just sell that onto a data broker where anyone from foreign intelligence agencies to uh, law enforcement um, could easily just buy that data um, and have all of this intelligence gathered against Americans without ever having to engage in anything um, on their own. Or it could be that they were already doing it in the service of of such an agency. And we have no, no evidence of that, um, that there is a nation state actor of any kind behind them. And it's sort of the, we don't know who's behind this of it all. Um, that is, I think the most concerning <laughs> red flag of all. 
what may be just as concerning for website owners is how this type of exploitation of consent management frameworks could put publishers, brands, and others in violation of privacy laws. The brand is responsible for any type of tracking technology that is on its site, that is deployed, whether or not it's on a website or an app, they're ultimately responsible because the brand is considered to be the gatekeeper. So Voldracus somehow or another is able to get data from the site. My guess is it's probably through a pixel or through some SDK. And so under the law, very technically speaking, the brand could be held liable for the data that is collected and passed to Voldracus. So how can companies guard themselves against a, another bad actor pulling a Voldracus and co-opting the transparency and consent framework's consent string? Well, I had hoped to have an answer to that from my Europe, but a spokesperson said that executives weren't available for interviews and never sent answers to the questions that I sent in an email. And so given that you all uncovered this earlier this year, you have the blog post about it, you've spoken about it, what have been the repercussions of this? What is the industry or the IAB or others doing to prevent this kind of thing going forward? Uh, there really hasn't been any. Um, obviously, we alerted the platforms um, and we don't know what actions they took, but we do know that we stopped seeing the campaign as soon as we did. So they appear to have stopped serving it. Um, and we know that, that law enforcement is aware that this is going on, but I have no knowledge of any actions they may have taken in response. Um, there haven't been any repercussions. They don't really have any auditability um, of the consent string. Um, so the the lack of protection for consent abuse was already something um, that this framework was under scrutiny for. There there was already um, heat on on the IAB to do something about this, and they do I think have a. Um, I think they call it the accountability platform in response, and there's some talk of adding some security um, mechanisms to the consent string, which is basically just signing so that you have a, a basic way of detecting the validity of the consent string. But neither of those are in place yet, um, and, and a lot could change. They may not get implemented at all at this stage. They're all still very much DVD. So those, um, the accountability platform, which should add like auditability, um, so you can detect more possible cases of consent abuse um, and just being able to prevent consent abuse by having better um, security on the consent string itself. Um, those were already kind of in the works. Got it. So having that auditability could have prevented this, or at least companies could have detected this earlier on. Yes. I, and I think the, the auditability is important, but it only allows you to detect violations in hindsight. Um, and there is, of course, the deterrent of knowing that your violations could be detected in hindsight. But the most important step really is adding security to um, the consent string structure itself. Okay. But as of this moment, there's nothing really stopping anyone else from following this playbook and executing this exact same procedure. Nothing whatsoever. Which may be the most worrying aspect of this whole story. 